Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be back for my third BrewCon, uh, one of my favorite events. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed lunch. Uh, who has had a drink so far today that is not water or coffee? <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Uh, anyway, so uh, after lunch uh, is always a challenging spot because especially after eating a bunch of pasta, everyone wants to fall asleep. Uh, but I'm a very active speaker, so we should be fine uh, from this. And we're going to talk about something that I think is very interesting, uh, the Vulcan leaks or Vulcan files. Uh, we'll get into them in a moment, but uh, a topic that I felt is very important and very interesting and in a lot of circles didn't seem to get as much attention when they were released as I thought they should have. Um, so I think it's worthwhile not just explaining what these were, but also getting into the details of how these items reflect and uh, what they tell us about cyber operations, specifically state-sponsored cyber operations in 2023. So, hello, who am I? I'm Joe Slowick, the person who is talking at you right now. Um, but uh, today I'm representing myself and my company, Paralis LLC, where I do CTI and OT consulting. But I also work for a company called Huntress in the United States, which is a managed detection and response provider. Previously, I've been kind of all over the place, <laughs> um, for better or for worse. I've done threat intel research at Dragos, at Domain Tools. I have done detection engineering team lead work at Gigamon. I got my start in security, though, in the US Navy. And I led the security team at Los Alamos National Laboratory for several years in the US. And I still live in Los Alamos, which means I got plenty of miles coming out here for BrewCon. That's OK. It was worth it. Anyway, enough about me. The main thing is the Vulcan files. What are they? Well, that's what we're going to start off with is talking about just what these documents that were leaked are and what they represent. But then we'll pivot into what Vulcan represents with respect to Russian cyber operations. So sort of a threat intelligence perspective on matters. But we'll then orient Vulcan capabilities in broader cyber history. What do these mean and how do they reflect on other operations, other actions that have been observed uh, across the spectrum. And then we'll get into more forward-looking perspectives of what Vulcan tells us about the future of cyber operations from a defender perspective as well as from a red teamer perspective and what we can learn from this. And then we'll conclude with some closing big thoughts. Maybe not so big thoughts, we'll see. Moderate sized thoughts. So the Vulcan files. What are the Vulcan files? So uh, in approximately a year and a half, two years ago, um, a individual who is anonymous, otherwise they would probably have fallen out of a balcony somewhere by now, um, in Russia uh, leaked a trove of documents relating to a number of cyber operation programs uh, carried out by a company called NTC Vulcan on behalf of several Russian intelligence agencies. These were primarily reported by two German journalists, uh, Heinz Muntinger and Hakan Tenverd, Tanaverdi. I always screw his name up, so if I've screwed it up again, I'm sorry, Hakan. Um, but they did excellent work in reviewing these documents, presented them in Der Spiegel, and then working through paper cut media. These were analyzed in a variety of outlets, including in English, in the Washington Post. I believe there was publication in Le Monde, uh, publications in The Guardian, uh, and similar of going over what these leaks represented at a high level. But we also saw security companies such as Mandiant and Dragos provi provide their own analysis of these items as well from the security practitioner perspective. Uh, the Vulcan files themselves dealt with a computer firm called NTC Vulcan, which was founded in 2010 by former Russian military personnel, and they were allowed or could participate in classified or sensitive work for the Russian government. Uh, so basically a government contractor, if you're an American like I am, it's like, oh, there's lots of those out there. There are. We'll get back to why that's an important data point in a bit. Uh, but the leaks themselves emerged from a uh, unknown individual, again, for their safety. Hopefully they're not in Russia anymore, but who knows. Uh, but an individual who was distraught and dismayed with the uh, resumption of hostilities in Ukraine, who leaked hundreds of pages of documents, which you can download online, and I'll have a link at the end of this presentation for those who want to look and can read Russian, uh, if you would like to analyze these yourself. Um, but provided this information to the German journalists in question who then worked with a consortium of other journalists and security researchers to understand what these documents were about. The significance of this is that we don't often see this level of insight into cyber programs. You could say cyber war if you want to. I'm not going to other than that because 
It's kind of a loaded term. Uh, but the idea is like these get into very detailed specifications, requirements, and contracting details for tools used by state-sponsored cyber actors. Short of some things like the Snowden leaks, which we'll get back to, uh, things like Lab Duken, um and other sorts of leak sites that are out there. We don't see all of this that much and very rarely in the level of detail and unredacted state that we saw with the Vulcan files. So pretty interesting things. There's NTC Vulcan, uh, at least that used to be their address. Hi guys. Um, uh, they have a nondescript building located in Moscow, uh, no big surprise there. But the main thing is that there were three primary programs that were documented in the documents that were leaked to the uh, Hakan and Hannes. The first and the one that we'll spend the most amount of time on in this presentation is something called ScanV, uh, which is a scanning enumeration and exploitation platform. Very interesting stuff in my opinion and I hope you share that opinion after I'm done explaining this to you. Uh, another program called Amazit, which was, is a information operations and data interception platform. Uh, very interesting stuff, but we won't spend a whole lot of time on that. And then there was another program, which I honestly didn't find that interesting, called Crystal 2 v It is a, almost like a pen testing suite for OT systems. Uh, it was really designed primarily as a testing and evaluation suite and not actually as a tool for use in victim networks. And there wasn't that much information on it, at least not in the files that I reviewed. So it just, one, we don't have that much time. Two, uh, it just didn't seem that sexy uh, compared to the other items. But that was the third program, uh, primary program identified in the files that were leaked uh, last year. But ScanV, it's very interesting. So this is from the Vulcan files. It's a diagram in Russian uh, that shows the architecture behind this program. Essentially, ScanV is a distributed architecture between multiple network, no, uh, network la classification layers, uh, both an internet-facing entity, an internal network and analysis uh, environment, and then a classified environment, which you can see if you look closely in the diagram, was pseudo air gapped, sneaker netted, uh, you might say, with uh, data transferred via USB and CD ROM drives between the internal network of the ScanV client and then the classified processing systems in the back end. So a fairly complex system and definitely incorporating not just a internet facing scanning enumeration and exploitation uh, system, but also extending into classified sources of information, intelligence, and uh, so forth, both for information gathering from victim networks as well as to push technical capabilities discovered in non-public spaces into the ScanV architecture to allow for follow-on actions. So in looking at ScanV, we're really talking about a distributed system that crosses multiple information boundaries. Not terribly interesting, I guess, but still says something about the complexity of the system and the multiple moving parts involved in establishing something along those lines. The main thing is that the system was designed for automated tasking and action within pre-programmed capabilities in the system itself. So ScanV worked by taking a catalog of vulnerabilities, both publicly known and not publicly known, Combining that with vulnerability scanning, both uh, publicly available and through commercial sources like Shodan, uh, and combining that with private sources and uh, non-public mechanisms to perform vulnerability scanning, and then to do actual exploitation of subsequently identified nodes. So a way of spraying the internet if you wanted to, to identify systems that are vulnerable to a stockpile of potential exploits in order to gain access to various infrastructure. But the purpose of this network isn't just to exploit for victim network purposes. I mean, that would seem obvious, like, oh, I just want to go and hack the internet. But the reason behind this is very interesting because while it certainly allows for the possibility of gaining access to primary victims, it appears, based upon the documentation and how this network was designed, as well as the user of this network, which is assessed, well, is known within the documents to be the GRU field post 74455, uh, special Technology Division, also known as Sandworm, uh, because their organization is mentioned in the procurement documents for this, that it appears this system was designed to build infrastructure for follow-on actions. So there are multiple ways to gather infrastructure for offensive purposes. You can spin up your own BPS at 
OVH, Linode, or something like that, and host your own domain and pass traffic through it. Or you could do things like, oh, there's a new WordPress CMS or plugin vulnerability. I'm going to exploit a bunch of sites and tunnel my traffic through there to my ultimate victims. Uh, ScanV looks like it's a way of acquiring other people's infrastructure at scale and tasking it at scale for offensive purposes. We'll come back to that shortly. Uh, Amazit, the other um, interesting program, uh, is an information operations platform. And you can see on the left-hand side of the monitor here references to Twitter, LiveJournal. This, this was only a couple of years ago, so trust me on this one. Uh, Facebook, the contact, uh, uh, and similar items, but it functioned as a platform to allow for not just the interception of various communications from SMS, MMS messages to various social media platforms, but also enabled for injection into those communication streams uh, by deploying physical hardware into the mobile network at uh, adversary controlled points of access will allow for the inline decryption and injection into communication streams to do things like influence a Twitter thread or to influence a blogger item to add uh, information operations payloads essentially into these communication items. So we see Amazit as both a collection and an operations platform that was capable of both capturing and proxying communication streams for collection for intelligence purposes, as well as manipulation for reasons unknown. Uh, what's also interesting about Amazit is that it had potential in both foreign and domestic targeting. So you think about Amazit as something that you basically go to your base station controller and plug in a box and it starts doing bad things. Well, that means it's mobile, uh, so I can certainly drive this out to Chechnya or Dagestan or so forth and use that as part of pacification operations in the Caucasus. But it could also be forward deployed into eastern Ukraine, into occupied areas. Now, admittedly, we have not seen evidence that Amazon has been deployed as part of the Ukraine conflict. But the idea being, and we've seen this in other aspects of the conflict in Ukraine, where Russia has done things like physically rerouted cables and done BGP manipulation to reroute traffic in occupied areas of Ukraine to Russian networks, that Amazon basically provides a mobile version of this sort of capability to both collect information within areas areas uh, under occupation or of consideration and to influence or manipulate communication in those areas. Uh, the sad thing is that the response to the Vulcan leaks was largely this, crickets, uh, chirp, 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 chirp. Uh, we just didn't hear a whole lot. Certainly there was an initial burst of publication the, the week that it was released, and again, Mandiant, Dragos, others uh, released some analysis, but compared to something like the Snowden leaks or the Vault 7 leaks or a number of other items, it seemed like these sort of disappeared very quickly. And that struck me as very curious because I thought this was really freaking cool um, because I'm a nerd, but so be it. Uh, and so I have to ask myself, like, why was there not such a response to the Vulcan leaks? Is it because of this asshole that getting, like, arrested or so forth? Like, I don't know. Like, maybe that's more of an American thing. Uh, maybe it was because we were focused on Taylor Swift. I don't know. Another possibility. The Eras tour was very, very impressive. Uh, we were focused on balloons. I don't know. Uh, that was a few months after the Vulcan files and so forth. Or maybe we were just focused on aliens. I don't know. But the main thing is that uh, the Vulcan files, for all the information provided in them, uh, really prov prov eh, provided a interesting insight into how a high-end state-sponsored adversary operates by getting into very detailed technical information, not just for how the programs themselves operated and were intended to operate, but even the sort of nuts and bolts of what the procurement process looked like getting into it. So, in my opinion at least, the Vulcan leaks represent a very significant item in the history of cyber operations. And after this brief overview, we need to really figure out like just what's inside. So, what does Vulcan mean or how is it related to what we know about Russian cyber operations since this is a Russian cyber program that we're dealing with? So, NTC Vulcan as a company is responsible for several programs that have been documented. So we've talked about three of these, Scanvi, Amazit, Crystal 2V. It's also important to note that after these were published, the folks at the Google, Google Threat Analysis Group, Google Tag, published analysis that linked the Miniduke payload associated with APT29 linked to Russia's SVR or Foreign Intelligence Service um, was also associated with Vulcan developers. So four programs in question. And what's interesting is that we see a 
diversity involved in what these programs were supporting. Uh, notably, SCONV, as I already mentioned, was linked to GRU 7445, uh, Sandworm. Amazit was linked to the FSB's Radio Research Institute, which makes sense if you think about Amazit's capability as a potential avenue for domestic information control and information capture. And then MiniDuke is linked to the SVR. Uh, so seeing various elements of Russia's military and intelligence complex involved in the Vulcan files. And Crystal 2V, was indeterminate as far as what it may link to. Again, also not as interesting of a program because it seemed more like a pen testing framework for OT. Uh, and again, we'll just not really talk about it because we don't have that much time. Uh, but the interesting thing is that for various reasons, if you've read works like Mark Galliotti's Putin's Hydra and uh, similar items, Russian intelligence agencies, especially if you split them between the civilian organizations like S FSB and SVR and military intelligence in the GRU, they don't really like each other, and in many times they're very competitive with each other. So if you go back to something like the 2016 operations against the U.S. elections, you would see GRU and, S and FSB in the same network at the same time and not coordinating with one another that they were actually uh, involved in the same breach because they often work as rivals with one another. As a result of that, when it comes to this sort of contracting work and so forth, you don't typically see one organization working with all three agencies at the same time. However, as we've seen in the previous slide, NTC Vulcan worked with each of these organizations and did so on fairly sensitive programs, uh, working with GRU, FSB, and SVR. That's not completely unique, there are other examples, but it is relatively rare and indicates that NTC Vulcan appears to be a fairly well-regarded uh, entity for developing capabilities for Russian military and Russian intelligence purposes. So in looking at Russian cyber in the private sector, yes, NTC Vulcan is out there, but they're not the only ones. We've seen similar examples, and in fact, I presented on this last year at Virus Bulletin of Schnickum, T-S-N-I-I-K-H-M, a uh, research institute linked to the Russian military, and a threat actor referred to most frequently as Xenotime, responsible for the Triton or Trisis event taking, that took place in Saudi Arabia in 2017. An interesting link between a civilian research organization, albeit one with military ties, and a offensive cyber operation that could have led to physical destruction of the plant in question. But we see this also with organizations like the SVA Institute and the SVR, uh, an organization called ODT and the front and botnet associated with FSB operations, uh, an institute known as Kavant and FSB. It's interesting to note there's a combination of both uh, private organizations like companies like you might expect like a you know, BAE or uh, Airbus or so, so forth that work in the defense sector, but also a number of universities and research institutes sponsored by the Russian government that then do dedicated work for various intelligence customers. Uh, so a very interesting relationship. But then also in the last uh, year, there was a ICS payload known, called Ink Controller or Pipe Dream, depending on which vendor you're going with, uh, that was very interesting in that it was disclosed by the U.S. government, Mandiant, Dragos, uh, and a few other entities, but was never actually seen in the wild as part of an active intrusion. It was theorized that that was linked to Russian operations, but never proved. But what's interesting is that if you trust, I'm going to call it Twitter, I hate the other name, uh, if you trust other sources, uh, you can see that you have folks that have done their research and at least claim that some of these programs that have previously been unattributed have been linked to companies like the uh, Russian tech company AST, uh, which was responsible for both in controller as well as for historical operations like Drovarub, which was published in 2020 by US and UK intelligence agencies. The main point of this is that there's an entire ecosystem of private and public-private organizations that work to assist and enable Russian cyber operations, that it's not just looking at the GRU or SVR as monolithic entities with their own in-house development capabilities, but rather, much like the West, as we'll talk about shortly, uh, organizations that seed out various work programs to specialists and hire them out in order to enable such operations. So looking at NTC Vulcan, it's an example, as well as potentially a pioneer, since they go back to 2010, of outsourced cyber development and engineering work for state-directed operations. Not everything is controlled within the halls of the 
fishbowl for the uh, you know, GRU and so forth, or similar entities for other air aspects of Russian intelligence operations, but instead engaging in contracted outwork to develop tools and capabilities, and potentially in some cases, as seen with Xenotime, even operations. But it's important to note that this is definitely not just Russia, something that we will get back to. But in looking at SCON-V, so we've already mentioned that it's associated with GRU 4, uh, 74455, also known as Sandworm. Uh, it's important to note that Sandworm, especially since about 2015, has largely relied on uh, compromising third-party infrastructure for its last hop uh, network nodes to victim environments. So going back to the 2015 Ukraine event, especially the 2016 in Destroyer incident, and then moving onward from there, Sandworm often relies on uh, compromising someone else's server and using that as the last known communication point to victim infrastructure. It's very useful from an operational security perspective, and it makes it more difficult for defenders to try to create a profile of how this adversary operates. And we've seen this in campaigns like XM Exploitation, noted by the NSA in 2020, as well as Centrion Explo Exploitation, which was documented by the French a ANSSI ANSI uh, in 2021. Um, but the main thing is that we have other examples beyond SCAN-V uh, for harvesting this sort of infrastructure, including um, you know, certainly examples like Indestroyer, but getting into more modern examples like Cyclops Blink, a IoT network device focused campaign that was built around trying to harvest victim infrastructure using vulnerable uh, networking devices like Soho, small office, home office routers, and so forth. Thus, uh, we're building out C2 infrastructure, but what SCON-V allows for is doing so at a scale and a velocity that is significantly greater than what would be possible through manual operations. So the architecture of SCON-V, the so what, why it's significant, is that it provides a system to automate the procurement, exploitation, and then tasking, an important uh, point, of this infrastructure to perform some action. Uh, it allows me to scale and to achieve uh, efficiencies in operation that wouldn't be possible otherwise. So in looking at this, uh, SCON-V works by first stockpiling vulnerabilities. And as we know, looking at the landscape, it's not just zero days, it's plus one days. Your Forta OS, your Netscaler, your Barracuda ESG, and similar vulnerabilities that people unfortunately don't patch for one reason or another until months after the fact. Uh, just identifying that there is some way to exploit and gain uh, quick remote code execution on victim infrastructure. But then in stockpiling these vulnerabilities, we need to identify nodes that are relevant uh, for exploitation, and ScanV does this through scanning, uh, but also by taking in information from third-party sources like Shodan and uh, other sources that are mentioned in the documentation before marshalling these victims into proxy chains as part of offensive cyber. Uh, it's worth noting that some of these other campaigns uh, appear to have been uh, leveraged as part of botnets or distributed networks for doing uh, DDoS attacks, which is not terribly sexy, but if you remember to the start of the newest phase of the Ukraine conflict, DDoS has typically been linked to either other offensive cyber operations or to physical operations, actual bombs, um, in Ukraine in order to degrade and take down communications from Ukrainian critical infrastructure to Ukrainian citizens. So having these large botnets uh, capable of taking part in the, these operations is relatively critical to their success. But also it's important to note that in looking at ScanV, we have, check out my orb. So orb is one of those terms that if someone says that, like me with an American accent, you can probably tell where they maybe worked once upon a time because orb is just a abbreviation for operational relay box, which is a terminology frequently used in US and UK intelligence agencies for compromised proxy nodes as part of C2 infrastructure. And in the case of SCON-V, it appears that that's what has been built, a way of creating these deniable operational relay boxes at scale and to manage them at scale, which is significantly easier than trying to spin up multiple VPS instances and manage those uh, independently of one another. So the so what behind Vulkan and, and SCON-V is that we see a focus on scalability and the control of widespread operations, going beyond individual specific hacks to hack the planet, uh, so to speak. And it was just the 30th anniversary? No, I'm not that old. 20th anniversary? No, 
it was the 30th anniversary of hackers. Shit. Uh, I am old. Anyway, uh, but the idea is, is that we start gaining greater efficiency in our operations and we increase the extent of potential cyber activity, both in terms of the volume of activity, because we have an increasing number of nodes we could rely on, as well as the geographic diversity behind that. So I can start pick and choosing, like, oh, I'm going to hack a uh, entity in the EU or NATO in Belgium and so forth. I will make sure that my C2 node is coming from the Netherlands in order to blend in with legitimate traffic. Whereas if I'm going after a target in India, I'll make sure that it's an Indian or uh, related item and not make come from Pakistan or some other area that might cause someone to be suspicious over why does this net flow exist within my environment. And I will advance, there we go. Uh, the main thing is that we start transitioning from this idea of one operator, one op, to massive distributed campaigns where a handful of individuals can programmatically interact with infrastructure at scale. I don't need to have a team of skilled hackers that can be tasked with doing every individual operation of interest, but rather rely on the automated infrastructure behind them to do this at a scale and speed that would be impossible otherwise. So this seems very interesting. Is, the question is, is it unique? So is the Vulcan activity unique? Well, Bugs Bunny says no. And I agree with Bugs in this instance, that no, this, this is not unique, that we've seen this before, we just haven't really talked about it that much, which is very unfortunate. Because can we see similar examples of ScanV in other operations over the last several years, 10 years, maybe even 20 years? Yes, we can. We could see that in other Russian cyber operations, which we'll get to here momentarily. We could also see it in operations related to the People's Republic of China. Also, provocatively, we could see this with operations that may be linked to the United States of America. Um, yeah, so this is not a novel approach, but it is an approach that is associated with your sort of high-end cyber threat actors. So we can choose our hacker here. Um, I love this image, by the way. Uh, if I could ever find who is responsible for creating this, I will credit them and print many, many stickers. But I cannot find the uh, original author or original designer, so I have not done that yet. But uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, Russia and cyber manipulation. We have seen this sort of activity before between both building compromised networks, like we see with ScanV, but also to go back to Amazit a little bit of monitoring and manipulating information, albeit mostly domestically. Uh, and we've seen this for in campaigns like VPN Filter and Cyclops Blink, which I already mentioned briefly, from building compromised networks. And from a manipulation information operations perspective, we've seen this with the Russian domestic program known as SORM. So for VPN Filter and Cyclops Blink, these were primarily network device targeting capabilities. Take over a bunch of vulnerable microtiques or vulnerable Cisco Soho network devices and so forth, compromise them, create a botnet around them and leverage these for purposes. Uh, it was assessed by, uh, in public statements from the US Department of Justice, uh, the UK G GCHQ and NCSC, that VPN filter was being built into a botnet designed to disrupt operations in Ukraine, and Cyclops Link was assessed to be a follow-on to the VPN filter operations. The main point is leveraging these compromised nodes both to proxy communication traffic, so going from the office outside of Moscow or Yekaterinburg or so, or, and so forth to victim environments with this compromised infrastructure in between to break the direct link between adversary and victim, but also to engage in that widespread disruptive activity such as the distributed denial of service. However, it's important to note that the folks at Cisco Talos and other organizations identified additional capabilities, particularly within VPN filter, that allowed for the capture of Modbus traffic. So if you're familiar with OT environments, Modbus is a communication protocol often associated with manufacturing uh, that is used to control uh, field devices in OT environments and manufacturing environments and so forth. Now, there was no evidence that there was a Modbus manipulation payload to engage in some sort of an attack, but just the fact that this traffic was being collected and being actively searched for indicates some interest in leveraging VPN filter for potential OT uses. Not sure what those would have been, but at least laying the groundwork and building the information necessary to potentially deploy a future capability with industrial targeting uh, characteristics. So ScanV represents a mechanism that takes something like VPN filter and Cyclops link and turns the volume up to 11 for a fun uh, Spinal Tap reference that no one got. Uh, but the idea being is that we start 
accelerating this activity in an automated way and improve the management of the nodes collected, the orbs, relay boxes, for cyber operations, increasing our scalability and the efficiency of what I've designed. So making this program much more widespread and much easier to manage and then leverage for offensive actions than more manual operations that had come previously. But also from the Amazon perspective, uh, SORM has been around for quite some time, uh, over 10 years at this point. Uh, it went live in 2012. It's a surveillance program where basically the FSB goes to Russian telco companies and says, hey, here's a blinky box. You will plug it into your server closet. Oh, no, you will plug it into your server closet. And by the way, you'll pay us for the effort that re is required to install it. Uh, and the idea behind this is to perform network traffic analysis and pattern analysis for domestic security purposes. I, you know, to catch terrorists, which we all know is not really what these things are for, whether you're talking Russia or elsewhere. Uh, but the idea is that uh, creating a widespread surveillance network of communications, uh, telephone communications and internet communications within the area. So Russia has done something like what Amazit was designed for from a collection standpoint. But what Amazit enables is taking a SORM-like capability and making it mobile. So SORM relies upon working with the telco providers in advance, well, working with the telco providers in advance to get this equipment installed and then capture communications, but not, as far as we know at least, being able to manipulate those communications. Amazit takes a SORM-like capability and allows you to make it mobile. So I can transfer it or move it into an occupied area or into a breakaway area and not just collect communications, but also uh, enable information operations like injecting into Twitter streams, manipulating blog posts and similar to uh, create some sort of messaging, you know, a PSYOP operation, so to speak, on the population in question that's targeted. Like I said, we have not seen evidence, although it would have been very obvious to have deployed something like this in occupied areas of Ukraine, but this is the sort of idea that if you had a Russia invasion of Ukraine or the Baltics or similar, that a payload like this would follow behind the military as a measure for potential population control, which is pretty scary actually, um, but still a latent possibility and not one that we've seen in practice just yet. So what about China? China. Uh, everyone wants to talk about China, Huawei and so forth. Have they done anything like this? Well, you're damn right that they have, um, particularly the Great Firewall. I think most people have heard of the Great Firewall, at least notionally, that China has this Great Firewall uh, that sits in between domestic traffic and the rest of the world that filters out lots of sensitive items, makes VPNs very difficult to use if you're a foreigner that happens to be traveling in China. Uh, I don't suspect I'll ever travel to China anytime soon, which I find very unfortunate. But if I did, I would definitely be throwing all my electronics away when I returned from that trip, uh, and they wouldn't be very useful while I was there anyway uh, because of the Great Firewall. Less talked about, though, is a complementary capability called the Great Cannon. This was disclosed in 2015 by the Monk School, the Citizen Lab folks, and the Great Cannon basically takes the same infrastructure behind the Great Firewall for deep packet inspection and traffic analysis and adds an offensive capability to it. Uh, namely, you know, I identify traffic of interest that flows through the uh, monitored infrastructure, and then when I identify payloads of particular interest, I respond by injecting into that traffic stream historically with a malicious JavaScript object to exploit the one of the parties involved in that communication. Uh, so providing a way to shoot into various communications of interest over time and to build a network of exploited nodes based off of passive traffic collection. That's pretty damn interesting and I was surprised that the Great Canon discussion didn't get more uh, recognition or more awareness when it was disclosed now seven years ago, eight years ago, uh, in 2015. Because the thing is, is that the Great Cannon is nearly 10 years old at this point. Disclosed in 2015, operational before then. It would be stupid to think that the Chinese cyber operations, information operations has remained static since then, especially since public disclosure and looking at increasing crackdowns, whether because of Xinjiang or uh, the zero COVID policies and similar items for population and information control. Quite likely and quite, I, I think it's safe to assume that the PRC authorities have moved on from the great canon and likely have even greater capabilities at this point in time. 
But the idea being is that we've seen PRC-related threat actors uh, like APT41, which is a kind of a stupid name when you think about it because it really encompasses a variety of threat groups at this stage, discussion for another time. Uh, but the idea of seeing entities doing widespread exploitation of on-premise Microsoft Exchange servers, Barracuda email security gateways, uh, and similar network infrastructure that the Chinese CNO authorities have definitely identified the value and uh, unique purpose behind building up large networks of exploited nodes, whether through very manual operations, like what we've seen through recent campaigns that have targeted zero-day vulnerabilities uh, and, and similar items, or through something like this great cannon program, which could allow for the automated creation of many exploited nodes by doing appropriate traffic collection and identification through midpoint intercept. Uh, midpoint is always a very interesting topic, which we're going to get into uh, right now, because while the Great Firewall and Great Cannon uh, are you know, maybe a bit dated, they give us a glimpse of similar ambitions and programs to what we see in SCONV and potentially Amazit as well, with the main question being, how has PRC scaled and improved these programs since they were identified almost 10 years ago at this point? Uh, unfortunately, we have a huge information gap, at least publicly, as far as what the state of these programs or successor programs would look like. But given what has taken place historically, I would argue that it is very doubtful that this mechanism has been, uh, or this methodology has been abandoned, even if the technical specifics have likely changed significantly since then. But hey, the U.S., what about them? You guys remember the Snowden leaks? That was a while ago. That was like 11 years ago now. Note, everything I'm saying from here on out represents items that have been reported in the public media and commentary on the work of others and is not my confirmation or denial of any sort of information that has been released as part of the alleged Snowden leaks. That's my cover my ass statement. Anyway, so the NSA leaks and their implications. The popular conception of the leaks is that we had this emphasis on privacy violations and other elements that are detrimental to open democracies. Very important stuff. We talk about prism exploitation. We are in Belgium. We could talk about Belgicom, although that was the UK, so diff different sort of animal. But the domestic surveillance and other operations that honestly make us very uncomfortable living in a free society that these sorts of things were happening. Clearly important but that was hardly the limit of what was disclosed because Mr. Snowden, for reasons unknown, uh, leaked a lot more than these sort of troublesome programs and went into many sort of capabilities more aligned with traditional intelligence operations. Because Snowden and potentially others, like we look to the Vault 7 leaks involving CIA tools, which was another actor entirely, and if you look at folks like Bruce Schneier, he identifies at least three distinct leakers of NSA tools and not even getting into the shadow brokers, again, conversation for another time, that there was significant information disclosed on cyber ne computer network operations programs associated with US and 5i uh, operations. Um, the less heralded of these, although certainly mentioned a little bit in public uh, doc commentary going back over 10 years, were widespread automated exploitation and control frameworks, things that sound an awful like what SCONV has turned into. Namely, we're talking about a quantum of exploitation. So as analyzed by Fox IT, uh, a program that was within the Snowden leaks called Quantum Insert operated as a midpoint exploitation program. Essentially, through deep packet inspection, traffic would be identified flowing through a adversary controlled node, and if the traffic met certain parameters, would then result in a exploit payload being sent to the original communicating device to try to uh, beat a race condition to arrive before the legitimate communication and land an exploit payload. Nasty stuff. Uh, and you can see that, you know, the idea being is that across the internet there would be some degree of monitoring between endpoint and the server of interest and that the adversary in question would monitor at the internet level by having control over certain routers or similar infrastructure and then be able to inject into that payload, but not only inject into it, but then marshal that exploited node into a automated management system referred to as turbine uh, within the leaks and within journal, uh, the analyst of various journalists and security researchers. So something 
that sounds very similar to what we've seen with SCON-D, of stockpiling a series of vulnerabilities, providing a means of automated, automatically identifying items of interest, in this case using selectors more associated with the traffic stream than purely based on vulnerabilities, and then exploiting these nodes and putting them within a database for automated management and follow-on tasking. Pretty interesting stuff, and this was pre-2012. So what we're seeing with quantum, turbine, et cetera, is automated exploitation systems disclosed, disclosed ah, I can speak, trust me, disclosed publicly in the early 2010s, but probably identified by adversaries earlier. Just like we saw with the case of Eternal Blue, leaked by the shadow brokers, but uh, compromised by PRC-related threat actors earlier and incorporated into their own operations uh, prior to 2017, it would be mysterious that we didn't, uh, if other rival intelligence agencies hadn't caught wind of these programs prior to Mr. Snowden's disclosure to the public. The main thing is that the alleged, alleged, Five Eyes state of the art in 2010, 2011, uh, around the time of when Mr. Snowden collected his documents, now seems to be reflected in what we're seeing in SCON V, the Great Canon, and similar operations. That's pretty interesting. What we're seeing is that if they're true, again, covering my ass here, Snowden leaks were arguably a disaster for the US. Uh, so certainly there were some very legitimate civil liberties questions that were raised by material, but a lot of other material on signals intelligence and computer operations capabilities by disclosing methodologies at a very uh, detailed and technical level. But it appears that it wasn't just journalists and civil society advocates that were paying attention. Other folks were keeping track of this as well and saying like, hey, that seems like a good fucking idea. I should probably do something like this as well. And thus we've seen, whether it's you know, VPN filter and Cyclops blink initially, leading to infrastructure uh, acquisition like Scan V or potentially the Great Canon, Adversary, other adversaries out there have been building similar programs and that may even be more ambitious than what was detailed in the Snowden files. So what does this mean for the future of offensive cyber? What's the big picture behind this? Well, the popular conception of government-sponsored hacking is like something like this. You get the guy in the black hoodie sitting in a dark room or whatever, typing away. No, it's never been like that, really. Because really, the realistic depiction of state-sponsored cyber operations is an office environment, a cubicle farm, uh, or similar, where we have multiple people working various targets and taking various positions along the entire attack chain, whether they're exploit developers, infrastructure access developers, uh, or on-network on operators and so forth, and creating this division of labor and so forth. Um, but as part of this, if we look at future applications of CNO, whether we're talking SCONV, Great Canon, or Quantum Insert, is that we're talking about scaling operations in a way where this guy doesn't matter. We need a few of him, or her, or them, in order to execute operations, and more importantly, to do the coding and so forth behind the research and analysis. But ultimately, it's these programs themselves operating in an automated, or at least semi-automated fashion, that are doing the hard work that you would traditionally associate with the hacker in a hoodie is now a server sitting in a closet somewhere with a catalog of vulnerabilities that is then looking for opportunities to build out a network of compromised nodes for follow-on tasking and action to actually carry out that intelligence agency's objectives. So in looking at this, we're really identifying the road to scalable cyber operations. That means personnel. Talent's expensive. Maybe not as much as it was a few years ago. I don't know what the situation in Europe has been in terms of hiring, but in the US, the information security and offensive security markets are pretty soft right now. So you could probably find people a bit easier than you could a few years ago. But nonetheless, it's hard to find really skilled people. You know, your really elite talent still demands a premium, and they're pretty rare to find. Well, if I can codify the capabilities of that elite talent into a system of automated exploitation, I need fewer rock stars and just need more developers capable of understanding how those rock stars work. That leads to more efficient and potentially more expansive action uh, as a result of that capability. But also targeting. If I'm a intelligence agency worth my salt, whether that's the NSA, the MSS, the GRU or SVR, the GCHQ, AVID, 
I don't know, they, they count. Um, you know, I arguably have global ambitions. And if I have global ambitions, that means I have targeting at a scale that, unless I just want to throw bodies at the problem, becomes very hard to maintain. So, assumptions on targeting kind of go out the window if I'm trying to build up a global CNO presence, a global signals intelligence presence, uh, and I need to start creating these networks of compromised infrastructure through which I can both transfer my communication to ultimate victims, but also use as collection and monitoring points to pull in information from various environments. Again, hack the planet. But also there's this operational security risk. Top tier threat actors don't like getting caught. Uh, you know, as much as we might laugh when uh, CrowdStrike or whatever finds another persona that they want to apply to a, some adversary out there in the world, that uh, generally speaking, that pisses adversaries off. Uh, in an ideal world, adversaries would prefer not to get caught, uh, even if it gives them a certain level of street cred, like, yeah, we're an advanced persistent threat. Um, so in trying to maintain that operational security and remain hidden in the shadows, building these deniable networks and transit points between my operators and my victims is a necessary aspect of maintaining that degree of anonymity. And when combined with other trends like the abuse of living off the land tools, repurposing various commercial pen testing frameworks like a Cobalt Strike or a Brute Rattel and so forth, or even abusing uh, legitimate software like remote maintenance and management tools, all combined along with the infrastructure perspective to create a deniability around cyber. So when looking at these things, it's important to note that Vulkan is a lagging indicator. These files are a couple of years old and in some cases several years old at this point. And the other examples we talked about, the Great Canon 2015, Quantum Insert 2012 and earlier, these are, this is how the landscape looked a while ago. Presumably, unless adversaries have become very, very freaking lazy, we have moved beyond this and are doing even scarier things right now because none of this is happening either in isolation or absent any sort of evolution on the part of threat actors. So we need to anticipate greater degrees of automation, queuing, and reactive targeting taking place by various threat actors across the globe. So if we wanted to have a thought experiment of how this might work, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning are very hot topics right now. Certainly they get overblown quite frequently, but within the context of what we're talking about in terms of creating deniable networks of infrastructure and tasking of implants for various purposes, it does not take a great imagination to think of a way of taking a list of known vulnerabilities or privately stockpiled vulnerabilities exploitation pathways and then objectives and to create an algorithm allowing for the automa complete automation from beginning to end of an exploitation pipeline that could basically create a schema that allows for capturing lots of infrastructure and then tasking it for either information collection or to then forward on other attack payloads, whether we're talking about something as simple as a denial of service attack or something as complex as an attack on critical infrastructure through a cyber, cyber physical mechanism by leveraging these same sorts of blueprints we've seen in Amazit and similar, or not Amazit, in Scan V and similar for much more ambitious purposes. So what should we expect? First, greater automation and improved scalability. This is pretty much, if you want to play with the big boys at this point, you need to be doing this. Um, so is Iran or North Korea or France or other, uh, you know, CNO entities of interest applying programs such as this? I would say if they are not, they're definitely looking at how to because this is where programs that are ambitious need to go these days. But as part of this, we start talking more about the leveraging of the neutral web of uh, victims that have no real value to you from an intelligence collection perspective, but are means to an end to gain access to follow-on infrastructure. Your home router, your the switch in your dentist office and similar is now becoming valuable infrastructure for use by intelligence agencies to masquerade and hide their tracks in route to their actual targets of interest. But also, as we talked about earlier, a reduced reliance on rock stars. Uh, we like to talk about you know, how pen testers can be so awesome and how the on-keyboard skills are so great. Well, they'll still be important to a point, but again, the real successful agencies are gonna be the ones that don't need a handful of elite hacksaws or whatever on keyboard, but rather the ones that have a bunch of data scientists and good developers that can take the same skills that these elite operators have and figure out a way to deploy them in a way that scales through artificial intelligence, through the development of algorithms, and similar ways of encoding that knowledge into software. And that gets us to 
non-bullshit applications of artificial intelligence. Plenty of bullshit applications of AI right now, uh, whether it's all your large language model stuff or uh, stable diffusion and whatnot, coming up with goofy images and so forth. Like, that's cute. But what we're really looking at here is, like, how do I start leveraging ways of analyzing data at scale and then making decisions on it that start applying to offensive cyber? And I'd argue that there's probably many organizations that are already there, and we just haven't heard about it yet. Uh, but if they're not already there, they definitely are working on it because assuming that they are not would assume a degree of ignorance and laziness that would be a disservice to the ambitions of skillful intelligence programs, whether we're talking about the SVR or we're talking about the CIA or NSA. So where does that leave us right now? It's like, yeah, man, adversaries innovate. Like, of course they do. Uh, well, we do see laziness when it comes to certain threat actors. Some payloads, like Winty as a malware family, is still out there. Still see people using Cobalt Strike because it works. Um, at the same time, we see innovation, like with the Solar Winds uh, intrusion campaign and injecting into software payloads at uh, compile time, like really fascinating stuff. Adversaries are going to continue to try to identify ways to evade defenders and achieve objectives and to do so in the most efficient ways possible. But it's also important to note that adversaries learn. They learn from talks like this or at Black Hat or CCC or elsewhere or whatever. They're taking notes and they're also taking notes when your mandiants or your invisos or whomever are disclosing operations about what they see as part of intrusions. And so to think that adversaries aren't performing their own open source research and taking notes on when you know, a North Korean campaign gets disclosed or an uh, American campaign gets disclosed would be a certain degree of willful ignorance. We have to assume that everyone is learning from everyone else, otherwise we're, they'd be setting themselves up for failure and stupidity. Thus, today's leaker disclosure is inspiration for tomorrow's capability and evolution. While we can't prove it, it is very odd to see that the quantum program, which was divulged in the Snowden leaks and reported in uh, publications like Wired, by uh, security companies like Fox IT, to then see so many aspects of that program reflected or at least have certain uh, overlaps with follow-on programs like China's Great Canon or then Scan V for Russia is not mere coincidence. It arguably reveals a certain degree of proliferation of capabilities and understanding for how to conduct operations. Thus, computer network operations, offensive cyber, is not a static field, but rather one that's constantly evolving with multiple factors in play, whether it's natural evolution and discovery within organizations, farming out capabilities and capability research to contractors and research institutes, or learning from what gets disclosed about other adversaries that are operating in these environments and incorporating that knowledge into your own uh, mechanisms and your own ways of operating. So what does this mean for defenders? I am a defender, so that is always my primary concern. Like, okay, that's cool, what do I do about it? Well, the thing is that first understanding that adversaries are constantly growing and evolving. We cannot assume a static threat landscape, but rather one that is constantly getting more difficult for us over time. Thus, legacy techniques and tradecraft for defense and identification will fail. Uh, relying on things like network infrastructure, um, deny listing or sinkholing and so forth, it was valuable when adversaries would spin up their own domains, register their own servers and so forth. It becomes significantly less interesting when you have adversaries that are compromising legitimate, blameless third-party infrastructure at scale and using that as part of their operations. And not only that, but doing so at a scale that makes one-off blocking and alerting no longer tenable or actionable. We need to evolve with adversaries in such a way that allows for an emphasis not on individual indicator analysis, but rather behavioral analysis and identifying anomalies in traffic that start revealing aspects of adversary operations. Thus, we need this enriched sort of detection and enrichment of individual observations. Defensive applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence, not just buzzwords. Again, I hate the buzz and bullshit around AI and so forth, but as a defender, I recognize that in order to appropriately scale to a way that we can defend against capabilities like what I've discussed in this uh, presentation so far, defenders are going to need to start automating on pace with adversaries. 
Failure to do so means that we will be overwhelmed. We cannot just keep throwing bodies in the sock or IR teams at the problem. We need to figure out ways of scaling machines in pace with adversaries to counter adversaries operating in more efficient and more prolific mechanisms. So the thing is, is that if adversaries are moving towards greater automation and efficiency, defenders have to too, otherwise we will lose. It is not a if or a possibility, it is a fact that um, we need to figure out ways of accurately and successfully implementing these sorts of automations within our workflows, within identification of uh, potentially malicious infrastructure, and then refinement to definitely identify things as malicious or benign in order to catch up with the state of offensive cyber. Um, you know, there's certainly some solutions out there right now. I don't think they're very good. Um, but we need to hold vendors or other researchers uh, responsible or uh, advocate for developing ways of meeting this challenge. But there's also advice for offense. And when I say offense here, I'm talking about red teamers who are okay, not offensive cyber operators at the state level who are assholes. Um, so in this case, human-driven operations are being replaced in the operations that we're trying to emulate from a pen testing perspective. It's not just about one hacker, one op, it's about an entire legion of capability developers, infrastructure uh, developers, and then hands-on operations uh, actions that we're trying to emulate, and that's very complex. Thus, really emulating what the state of the now looks like from adversary op operations means moving beyond just sending a fish, deploying Cobalt Strike Beacon, moving laterally through PS Exec and Mimikatz, getting the domain controller and calling it even, but really understanding what is it that these threat actors are doing and how are they operating and how can I design a better red teaming engagement around this? Certainly depending on what are the threats that I'm trying to emulate. E-crime is still operating in this relatively manual but very much a division of labor perspective. Your high-end state actors have moved beyond that and are working from this distributed, efficient perspective of greater automation. Thus, testing and probing environments, or at least accurately emulating how this looks, is going to become more challenging. Uh, the value to that is that in doing so, as from a red teamer perspective, we can greatly enhance both the understanding on the defender side as well as provide a strong demand signal on the defender side for the need to better evolve and deploy improved capabilities to detect these methodologies. But just remaining, even if it still works, because it is problematic how often, like, you know, again, a fish, Mimikatz, PS Exec, and Cobalt Strike Beacon work to take down an entire domain. It's sad, but it's true. But for a lot of organizations, also demonstrating that, hey, if you patch this, that's great, or if you fix this, that's fine. Know that this is the state of the now, and that's only going to get worse going forward, and figure out a way to try to emulate that behavior in terms of infrastructure that is almost impossible to di differentiate from legitimate network communications, automated uh, exploitation and scanning of infrastructure that blends in below, or uh, moves below the noise level, making it difficult to pick up from an NDR perspective. That's kind of where we need to evolve from a red teaming perspective to really provide a honest evaluation and an honest assessment of what a true state-sponsored entity would look like in these environments. So where do we go from here? Well, networks of various types will continue to be weaponized by diverse parties. Uh, what's going on for your APTs right now is going to be the state of the now for your e-crime actors pretty soon, if not already. Um, expect this to get worse before it gets better, meaning that we're also going to see lots of victims from these campaigns being means to an end for adversaries as opposed to the actual ultimate victims themselves. A very diverse landscape where everyone is potentially at play for being roped into someone's offensive operation. But, you know, while the increasing scale and velocity of these sorts of campaigns represented by automated frameworks like ASCON-V and other elements disclosed in the Vulkan files will make things very challenging, it's not going to make things impossible. We have avenues to pursue that can maybe not get ahead of these problems, but at least co-evolve with them so that we as defenders, as asset owners, as network owners can have something to respond to these sorts of challenges. It's not going to be easy. I, tell, I say this in my training classes all the time. Everything I tell you is going to be accurate, but none of it's going to be easy. There is no silver magic bullet that you could use in order to take out threat actors short of taking a fire ax and just cutting the cables into your server room and creating a no kidding air gap network. Uh, as long as we want connectivity, we're going to have to understand what the state of the now and the state of the near future will be for adversaries and determine ways of evolving with them and identifying how to both detect them and to mitigate an intrusion once it takes place. So 
before I get to questions, lots of work cited. <laughs> Do not take a picture of this, because you can take a picture of this instead and download the slides right now. Uh, if you're so inclined. Uh, and that will get you the links to all the references and so forth. So feel free to do that um, if you're so interested. But otherwise, uh, questions here and in the streaming room as well. <laughs> uh, thank you. That, that covered an awful lot. Yes. Some you've not mentioned North Korea. Is that something that you're interested in? Is it something we know an, an awful lot about, particularly with regard to their capabilities relative to Russia, China, USA? Comments? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I, I looked as part of this research in identifying similar activity from a North Korean as well as an Iranian cyber perspective, and I couldn't find anything quite like this. Uh, not on like the automated tasking and exploitation framework perspective. That's not to say that North Korea, Iran, and some others are very, are, are not very prolific in this environment. It just seems like they're still operating maybe a step behind this for one reason or another, or more worryingly, we just haven't identified what they're using yet. So if you look at North Korean operations, for example, um, you know, there's there, there have been operations around something that's been referred to in security circles as Operation Dream Job which is sending a phishing message that contains a uh, reference to an embedded object to pull back a macro-enabled document with a job-themed uh, item for like aerospace companies, the Walt Disney Company, I don't know why. Maybe Kim Jong-un needs better animation content, I don't know, or he wants to get a lead on the next Star Wars. But um, the idea being though is that they're definitely doing something, either they're throwing lots of bodies and developing this content and the architecture behind it, or maybe they've developed something uh, potentially not on the scale of like a SCON-V or a Quantum, but something to develop, manage, and then task these widespread phishing campaigns in order to make sure that they can control everything that comes out of them, to say nothing of their operations in crypto. So I can't say directly that there, there is an example that aligns with what we talked about in this presentation, but it would surprise me if there was not interest in doing so and if they were not working on something like this right now if it doesn't exist already and we just haven't found it yet. Yep. How about the other room? How would we tell? Do I, like Let me ask, are there any questions here in the streaming room? Yeah. No, it seems there are no questions. Over to you. Okay. This was so interesting that no one has any questions. I explained everything thoroughly. Oh, up there. Hi, uh, interesting talk. In, in your advice for defense, uh, you mentioned sinkholing and deny listing as no longer relevant. Um, what are perhaps other very popular products and services used in defense today that are soon to be obsolete? Right. Uh, you know, that's a really good question. It, it's, a, it's a difficult question because from a variety of organizations, especially very small organizations, things like maintaining an IP domain uh, block list or similar or a hash alert or block list is about really the best that they can do right now because they can't afford the fancy sort of whiz-bang solution. But as we start going up the scale of security maturity to larger enterprises and similar, relying on very static defenses is a losing battle because, and Miko made a mention of this in his keynote this morning as well, in terms of the implications for things like artificial intelligence on malware development and fuzzing and so forth, that the speed at which adversaries can evolve and shift operations is going to outpace our ability as defenders to block or eliminate known intrusion or known communication vectors. So the idea behind this is that identifying the specific indicators behind intrusions will remain important and valuable from a forensic and investigation standpoint moving forward. That will not change. But from a proactive or from an active defense standpoint, relying on the technical observables from the previous intrusion, maybe once in a while you get lucky, but for the most part, we really need to figure out a way to conduct behavior-based defense. So that could be for, like, an example would be profiling network infrastructure to see, like, okay, I have identified in NetFlow that I am receiving an authentication uh, attempt from a server running in a VPS environment. 
That should never happen. It's irrespective of the specific IP that's profiling things based on the ASN and the server type. Those are the sorts of things that we need to start doing so that we can identify when an anomalous connection or an anomalous behavior takes place that doesn't make sense for the action that's, uh, which is a benign action, a remote external logon for a system that you would expect such activity to take place, but coming from a node that makes no sense to do that for the business model. Um, there's a lot that we can talk about on this. If you'd like, we can discuss uh, afterwards as well some of these options. Like this is an hours long discussion in, it, uh, in itself, but that's just a very brief example of uh, kind of where we need to go and where we need to press beyond legacy capabilities. Uh, one in the back and one in the middle. Time is up. Oh, I went really fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, a very interesting talk. Um, you refused to use the term uh, cyber warfare uh, for this, but uh, if you look at the, yeah, the, the actors which are doing this, these are states, so it's actually, yeah, you're being attacked by a state. Uh, I guess we're mostly working for private companies here, and um, the scale of the attack um, is probably uh, yeah, outpacing what a private company can do in terms of defense. So shouldn't there be um, yeah, more focus on um, the cyber defenses of a country in, in this case, rather than having to try uh, individual corporations try to defend to this? Because if you look at the speed of development uh, of the uh, adversary, there, it's hard to yeah, keep pace with that, right? Yes, I agree. Um, but it gets into some very interesting uh, points. And we have a lot of time here, so we can certainly have quite a discussion. So I apologize that I zipped through that presentation faster than I anticipated. Um, but anyway, so is it realistic to expect private enterprises to compete against or defend against a well-resourced state-backed entity? Probably not. Uh, I would say that that's probably unrealistic and very unfortunate. But then the question is, like, well, then what do we do? And one interesting thing that came up is we're, you know, one of the main thrusts of this presentation were programs like SCANV, where we have the creation of botnets or relay nodes of otherwise neutral infrastructure that isn't going to be, uh, that isn't the point of the attack, but rather enables it to take place elsewhere. What do you do about that? Well, it's interesting, like Cyclops Blink, for example, uh, and then, or even looking at something more recent e-crime focus, the CACBOT takedown. Uh, the CACBOT takedown was very interesting because the US Department of Justice pushed out code to uh, take out CACBOT as an installed item. That's very provocative because what if it didn't work? What if it bricked servers, some servers accidentally instead and so forth? And are you comfortable with a government in responding to a large cyber problem pushing something to your system to mitigate that? That starts getting us into very interesting privacy and who owns what and who controls what sort of questions. But at the same time, is it realistic, especially looking at the expansiveness of some of these campaigns, to expect a GP's office that runs a vulnerable uh, microtik router, for example, through their ISP, to maintain that device and if it gets infected, to kick, off, kick, kick out sandworm from it? That seems unrealistic, but thinking that the NSA or the FBI is going to come in and remove them for you, especially if that GP's office is outside the US, becomes very provocative very quickly. And I think these are the sorts of questions that we need to start asking because none of the answers are good and we need to start figuring out what we're comfortable with in delegating that responsibility. Otherwise, um, you know, my sort of uh, response or feeling on the subject is that we need to start thinking of government as being an entity that can leverage its power potentially in partnership with others, if you think about the European Union, if you think about the US, if you think about NATO and so forth, like, okay, we have lots of resources, why are we not working on these problems together to some extent of trying to come up with what would these solutions be like? What would the sort of information sharing that would be valuable to defenders instead of releasing indicators on campaigns that are nine months old at this point, what would that look like? And emphasizing those items before we get into the response phase of things, because that starts getting really sticky uh, and really uh, interesting really quickly. Okay. Uh, hi, thanks uh, for the presentation. Uh, it was very interesting. 
Um, I noticed that it uh, didn't include the UAE and Dark Matter, Project Raven. Yep. Um, is it the same reason as uh, North Korea was not included, or is there another reason or other reasons why uh, it's not mentioned in the presentation? Yeah, I mean, the main reason is that other than just broad familiarity with the Dark Raven activity, I really don't have that much expertise on the subject, <laughs> um, and that we had a lot of content already. Having said that, though, um, it is interesting in thinking about you know one of the earlier uh, arguments within this presentation of the privatization of cyber operations that you know, an organization like NTC Vulcan or Lockheed Martin uh, or similar, like, okay, we have some familiar, familiarity with these things and we see them as complements to otherwise state-managed programs. But then getting into something like dark matter, where, and there is more than dark matter out there right now, unfortunately, the UAE is not stopped. Um, the complete privatization of this sort of skill, or, or basically hiring mercenaries to uh, engage in these operations. That's really interesting and is almost a discussion in and of itself of at what point have we moved well beyond the sort of, uh, and I gave a talk like this actually in uh, Den Haag at the TICS event, the Threat Intelligence Exchange, a few months ago. Unfortunately, that talk was not public. But at what point do we see that sort of state control of cyber violence, since we're not talking about actual violence, erode, and that we start empowering all these other private entities to engage in this space? We've already seen it on the defensive side. Uh, the sort of capabilities that you see in a Mandiant, a Sentinel-1, and so forth, like the idea that you have these private companies engaging in defense operations against state-sponsored entities is like mind-blowing. Like we wouldn't expect private military contractors to, hopefully not, uh, you know, of defending the border of Estonia with Russia if there was an invasion or something, that would be absurd. Yet we're expecting private companies to do that on the defensive side when it comes to cyber. But what about the offensive side, which we've seen with dark matter? What does that say about the state of operations? And could we ever see a US, a Russia, or a European country ceding that much authority and that much capability to a private actor over which they maintain very little control otherwise? Uh, dark matter is interesting because I'm sure the UAE had plenty of control over those individuals while they were in country, uh, but there's still the possibility of that capability escaping and then leaving for the highest bidder afterwards. Um, so that's kind of a really roundabout way of addressing your question, I'm sorry, uh, but it raises a lot of other points as well in terms of the control and who's doing this sort of work. And again, I think this is one of those areas that people have latched on to the convenience that, oh, I can just hire out this sort of work to a third party without thinking through like, well, what if they want to sell that to someone else who offers more money and how does that work? Like if the UAE contractors were then uh, taken on by Qatar, for example, which is not necessarily a friendly relationship all the time because the Qataris decided to double their salary. How does that work in practice? And I don't think people have thought through that uh, too effectively yet. I hope that at least addressed part of it. <laughs> okay.